Section 14 of Old Greek Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Old Greek Stories by James Baldwin. Section 14. The Adventures of Theseus. Part 4. Wrestler and Wrongdoer. Keeping the sea always in view, Theseus went onward a long day's journey to the north and east, and he left the rugged mountains behind, and came down into the valleys, and into a pleasant plain where there were sheep and cattle pasturing, and where there were many fields of ripening grain. The fame of his deeds had gone before him, and men and women came crowding to the roadside to see the hero who had slain club-carrier and pine-bender, and grim old Skiron of the cliff. "'Now we shall live in peace,' they cried, "'for the robbers who devoured our flocks and our children are no more.' Then Theseus passed through the old town of Megara, and followed the shore of the bay towards the sacred city of Eleusis. "'Do not go into Eleusis, but take the road which leads round it through the hills,' whispered a poor man who was carrying a sheep to market. "'Why shall I do that?' asked Theseus. "'Listen, and I will tell you,' was the answer. "'There is a king in Eleusis whose name is Kerkion, and he is a great wrestler. "'He makes every stranger who comes into the city wrestle with him, "'and such is the strength of his arms that when he has overcome a man "'he crushes the life out of his body. "'Many travellers come to Eleusis, but no one ever goes away.' "'But I will both come and go away,' said Theseus and with his club upon his shoulder he strode onward into the sacred city. "'Where is Kerkion, the wrestler?' he asked of the warden at the gate. "'The king is dining in his marble palace,' was the answer. "'If you wish to save yourself, turn now and flee before he has heard of your coming.' "'Why should I flee?' asked Theseus. "'I am not afraid.' And he walked on through the narrow street to old Kerkion's palace. The king was sitting at his table, eating and drinking, and he grinned hideously as he thought of the many noble young men whose lives he had destroyed. Theseus went up boldly to the door and cried out, "'Kerkion, come out and wrestle with me!' "'Ah,' said the king, "'here comes another young fool whose days are numbered. Fetch him in and let him dine with me, and after that he shall have his fill of wrestling.' So Theseus was given a place at the table of the king, and the two sat there and ate and stared at each other, but spoke not a word. And Kerkion, as he looked at the young man's sharp eyes and his fair face and silken hair, had half a mind to bid him go in peace, and seek not to test his strength and skill. But when they had finished, Theseus arose and laid aside his sword and his sandals and his iron club and stripped himself of his robes, and said, "'Come now, Kerkion, if you are not afraid. Come and wrestle with me.' Then the two went out into the courtyard, where many a young man had met his fate, and there they wrestled until the sun went down, and neither could gain aught of advantage over the other. But it was plain that the trained skill of Theseus would, in the end, win against the brute strength of Kerkion. Then the men of Eleusis, who stood watching the contest, saw the youth lift the giant king bodily into the air, and hurl him headlong over his shoulder to the hard pavement beyond. "'As you have done to others, so will I do unto you,' cried Theseus. But grim old Kerkion neither moved nor spoke, and when the youth turned his body over and looked into his cruel face, he saw that the life had quite gone out of him. Then the people of Eleusis came to Theseus, and wanted to make him their king. "'You have slain the tyrant who was the bane of Eleusis,' they said. "'And we have heard how you have also rid the world of the giant robbers, who were the terror of the land. Come now, and be our king, for we know that you will rule over us wisely and well.' "'Some day,' said Theseus, "'I will be your king, but not now, for there are other deeds for me to do.' and with that he donned his sword and his sandals and his princely cloak, 
and threw his great iron club upon his shoulder, and went out of Eleusis, and all the people ran after him for quite a little way, shouting, May good fortune be with you, O king, and may Athena bless and guide you. Part V. Procrustes the Pitiless Athens was now not more than twenty miles away, but the road thither led through the Parnese Mountains, and was only a narrow path winding among the rocks and up and down many a lonely wooded glen. Theseus had seen worse and far more dangerous roads than this, and so he strode bravely onward, happy in the thought that he was so near the end of his long journey. But it was very slow travelling among the mountains, and he was not always sure that he was following the right path. The sun was almost down when he came to a broad green valley where the trees had been cleared away. A little river flowed through the middle of this valley, and on either side were grassy meadows where cattle were grazing, and on a hillside close by, half hidden among the trees, there was a great stone house with vines running over its walls and roof. While Theseus was wondering who it could be that lived in this pretty but lonely place, a man came out of the house and hurried down the road to meet him. He was a well-dressed man, and his face was wreathed with smiles, and he bowed low to Theseus and invited him kindly to come up to the house and be his guest that night. "'This is a lonely place,' he said, "'and it is not often that travellers pass this way. But there is nothing that gives me so much joy as to find strangers and feast them at my table, and hear them tell of the things they have seen and heard. Come up, and sup with me, and lodge under my roof, and you shall sleep on a wonderful bed which I have, a bed which fits every guest and cures him of every ill. Theseus was pleased with the man's ways, and as he was both hungry and tired, he went up with him, and sat down under the vines by the door, and the man said, Now I will go in and make the bed ready for you, and you can lie down upon it and rest and later, when you feel refreshed, you shall sit at my table and sup with me, and I will listen to the pleasant tales which I know you will tell. When he had gone into the house, Theseus looked around him to see what sort of a place it was. He was filled with surprise at the richness of it, at the gold and silver and beautiful things with which every room seemed to be adorned, for it was indeed a place fit for a prince. While he was looking and wondering, the vines before him were parted, and the fair face of a young girl peeped out. "'Noble stranger,' she whispered, "'do not lie down on my master's bed, for those who do so never rise again. Fly down the glen and hide yourself in the deep woods ere he returns, or else there will be no escape for you.' "'Who is your master, fair maiden, that I should be afraid of him?' asked Theseus. "'Men call him Procrustes, or the Stretcher.' said the girl, and she talked low and fast. He is a robber. He brings hither all the strangers that he finds travelling through the mountains. He puts them on his iron bed. He robs them of all they have. No one who comes into his house ever goes out again. "'Why do they call him the stretcher? And what is that iron bed of his?' asked Theseus, in no wise alarmed. "'Did he not tell you that it fits all guests?' said the girl." and most truly it does fit them, for if a traveller is too long, Procrustes hews off his legs until he is of the right length. But if he is too short, as is the case with most guests, then he stretches his limbs and body with ropes until he is long enough. It is for this reason that men call him the stretcher. "'Methinks that I have heard of this stretcher before,' said Theseus and then he remembered that some one at Eleusis had warned him to beware of the wily robber, Procrustes, who lurked in the glens of the Parnese peaks and lured travellers into his den. "'Hark, hark!' whispered the girl. "'I hear him coming!' And the vine leaves closed over her hiding-place. The very next moment Procrustes stood in the door, bowing and smiling as though he had never done any harm to his fellow-men. "'My dear young friend,' he said, "'the bed is ready, and I will show you the way. "'After you have taken a pleasant little nap, "'we will sit down at table, 
and you may tell me of the wonderful things which you have seen in the course of your travels. Theseus arose and followed his host, and when they had come into an inner chamber, there, surely enough, was the bedstead of iron, very curiously wrought, and upon it a soft couch which seemed to invite him to lie down and rest. But Theseus, peering about, saw the axe and the ropes, with cunning pulleys, lying hidden behind the curtains, and he saw, too, that the floor was covered with stains of blood. "'Now, my dear young friend,' said Procrustes, "'I pray you to lie down and take your ease, for I know that you have travelled far, and are faint from want of rest and sleep. Lie down, and while sweet slumber overtakes you, I will have a care that no unseemly noise, nor buzzing fly, nor vexing gnat, disturbs your dreams. "'Is this your wonderful bed?' asked Theseus. "'It is,' answered Procrustes, "'and you need but to lie down upon it, and it will fit you perfectly.' "'But you must lie upon it first, said Theseus, "'and let me see how it will fit itself to your stature.' "'Ah, no,' said Procrustes, "'for then the spell would be broken.' and as he spoke his cheeks grew ashy pale. "'But I tell you, you must lie upon it,' said Theseus, and he seized the trembling man around the waist, and threw him by force upon the bed. And no sooner was he prone upon the couch, than curious iron arms reached out and clasped his body in their embrace, and held him down so that he could not move hand or foot. The wretched man shrieked and cried for mercy, but Theseus stood over him and looked him straight in the eye. "'Is this the kind of bed on which you have your guests lie down?' he asked. But Procrustes answered not a word. Then Theseus brought out the axe and the ropes and the pulleys, and asked him what they were for, and why they were hidden in the chamber. He was still silent, and could do nothing now but tremble and weep. "'Is it true,' said Theseus, that you have lured hundreds of travellers into your den only to rob them? Is it true that it is your wont to fasten them in this bed, and then chop off their legs or stretch them out until they fit the iron frame? Tell me, is this true? It is true, it is true, sobbed Procrustes, and now kindly touch the spring above my head and let me go, and you shall have everything that I possess. But Theseus turned away. You are caught, he said, in the trap which you set for others and for me. There is no mercy for the man who shows no mercy. And he went out of the room, and left the wretch to perish by his own cruel device. Theseus looked through the house, and found there great wealth of gold and silver and costly things, which Procrustes had taken from the strangers who had fallen into his hands. He went into the dining-hall, and there indeed was the table spread with a rich feast of meats and drinks and delicacies, such as no king would scorn. But there was a seat and a plate for only the host, and none at all for guests. Then the girl whose fair face Theseus had seen among the vines came running into the house, and she seized the young hero's hands and blessed and thanked him, because he had rid the world of the cruel Procrustes. Only a month ago, she said, my father, a rich merchant of Athens, was travelling towards Eleusis, and I was with him, happy and carefree as any bird in the green woods. This robber lured us into his den, for we had much gold with us. My father he stretched upon his iron bed, but me he made his slave. Then Theseus called together all the inmates of the house, poor wretches whom Procrustes had forced to serve him and he parted the robbers' spoils among them, and told them that they were free to go wheresoever they wished. And on the next day he went on, through the narrow crooked ways among the mountains and the hills, and came at last to the plain of Athens, and saw the noble city, and in its midst the rocky height where the great temple of Athena stood, and a little way from the temple he saw the white walls of the palace of the king. When Theseus entered the city, and went walking up the street, everybody wondered who the tall, fair youth could be. But the fame of his deeds had gone before him, and soon it was whispered that this was the hero who had slain the robbers in the mountains, 
and had wrestled with Cercyon at Eleusis, and had caught Procrustes in his own cunning trap. "'Tell us no such thing,' said some butchers who were driving their loaded carts to market. "'The lad is better suited to sing sweet songs to the ladies than to fight robbers and wrestle with giants.' "'See his silk and black hair,' said one. "'And his girlish face,' said another. "'And his long coat dangling about his legs,' said a third. "'And his golden sandals,' said a fourth. "'Ha, ha!' laughed the first. "'I wager that he never lifted a ten-pound weight in his life. "'Think of such a fellow as he hurling old Skiron from the cliffs. "'Nonsense!' "'Theseus heard all this talk as he strode along, "'and it angered him not a little. "'But he had not come to Athens to quarrel with butchers. "'Without speaking a word, he walked straight up to the foremost cart, and, before its driver had time to think, took hold of the slaughtered ox that was being hauled to market, and hurled it high over the tops of the houses into the garden beyond. Then he did likewise with the oxen in the second, the third, and the fourth wagons, and, turning about, went on his way, and left the wonder-stricken butchers staring after him, speechless in the street. He climbed the stairway which led to the top of the steep rocky hill, and his heart beat fast in his bosom as he stood on the threshold of his father's palace. "'Where is the king?' he asked of the guard. "'You cannot see the king,' was the answer. "'But I will take you to his nephews.' The man led the way into the feast hall, and there Theseus saw his fifty cousins sitting about the table, and eating and drinking and making merry, and there was a great noise of revelry in the hall, the minstrels singing and playing, and the slave-girls dancing, and the half-drunken princes shouting and cursing. As Theseus stood in the doorway, knitting his eyebrows and clinching his teeth for the anger which he felt, one of the feasters saw him and cried out, "'See the tall fellow in the doorway! What does he want here?' "'Yes, girl-faced stranger,' said another. "'What do you want here?' "'I am here,' said Theseus, "'to ask that hospitality which men of our race never refuse to give.' "'Nor do we refuse,' cried they. "'Come in, and eat and drink, and be our guest.' "'I will come in,' said Theseus, "'but I will be the guest of the king. Where is he?' "'Never mind the king,' said one of his cousins. "'He is taking his ease, and we reign in his stead.' But Theseus strode boldly through the feast hall, and went about the palace asking for the king. At last he found Aegeus, lonely and sorrowful, sitting in an inner chamber. The heart of Theseus was very sad as he saw the lines of care upon the old man's face, and marked his trembling, halting ways. "'Great king,' he said, "'I am a stranger in Athens.' and I have come to you to ask food and shelter and friendship such as I know you never deny to those of noble rank and of your own race. "'And who are you, young man?' said the king. "'I am Theseus,' was the answer. "'What? The Theseus who has rid the world of the mountain robbers, and of Cercyon the wrestler, and of Procrustes the pitiless stretcher?' "'I am he,' said Theseus, and I come from old Troezen, on the other side of the Saronic Sea. The king started and turned very pale. Troezen, Troezen, he cried. Then, checking himself, he said, Yes, yes, you are welcome, brave stranger, to such shelter and food and friendship as the king of Athens can give. Now it so happened that there was with the king a fair but wicked witch named Medea, who had so much power over him that he never dared do anything without asking her leave. So he turned to her and said, "'Am I not right, Medea, in bidding this young hero welcome?' "'You are right, King Aegeus,' she said, "'and let him be shown at once to your guest-chamber, that he may rest himself and afterwards dine with us at your own table.' Medea had learned by her magic arts who Theseus was, and she was not at all pleased to have him in Athens, for she feared that when he should make himself known to the king, her own power would be at an end. So, while Theseus was resting himself in the guest-chamber, 
she told Aegeus that the young stranger was no hero at all, but a man whom his nephews had hired to kill him, for they had grown tired of waiting for him to die. The poor old king was filled with fear, for he believed her words, and he asked her what he should do to save his life. "'Let me manage it,' she said. "'The young man will soon come down to dine with us. I will drop poison into a glass of wine, and at the end of the meal I will give it to him. Nothing can be easier. So, when the hour came, Theseus sat down to dine with the king and Medea, and while he ate he told of his deeds, and of how he had overcome the robber giants, and Cercyon the wrestler, and Procrustes the pitiless. And as the king listened, his heart yearned strangely towards the young man, and he longed to save him from Medea's poisoned cup. Then Theseus paused in his talk to help himself to a piece of the roasted meat, and, as was the custom of the time, drew his sword to carve it, for you must remember that all these things happened long ago, before people had learned to use knives and forks at the table. As the sword flashed from its scabbard, Aegeus saw the letters that were engraved upon it, the initials of his own name. He knew at once that it was the sword which he had hidden so many years before, under the stone on the mountainside above Troezen. "'My son, my son!' he cried, and he sprang up and dashed the cup of poisoned wine from the table, and flung his arms around Theseus. It was indeed a glad meeting for both father and son, and they had many things to ask and to tell. As for the wicked Medea, she knew that her day of rule was past. She ran out of the palace, and whistled the loud, shrill call, and men say that a chariot drawn by dragons came rushing through the air, and that she leaped into it and was carried away, and no one ever saw her again. The very next morning Aegeus sent out his heralds to make it known through all the city that Theseus was his son, and that he would in time be king in his stead. When the fifty nephews heard this they were angry and alarmed. "'Shall this upstart cheat us out of our heritage?' they cried, and they made a plot to waylay and kill Theseus in a grove close by the city gate. Right cunningly did the wicked fellows lay their trap to catch the young hero, and one morning as he was passing that way alone, several of them fell suddenly upon him with swords and lances and tried to slay him outright. They were thirty to one, but he faced them boldly and held them at bay while he shouted for help. The men of Athens, who had borne so many wrongs from the hands of the nephews, came running out from the streets, and in the fight which followed every one of the plotters who had lain in ambush was slain, and the other nephews, when they heard about it, fled from the city in haste and never came back again. End of section 14